Thank you all. We'll, we promise to keep this entertaining. Uh, I promised the panelists we would keep this conversational. Um, for those, that you, those of you that don't know, this is our Emerging Tourism Stars uh, winners for this year. So give them a round of applause. We have, and everybody wave when I say your name, Tina Archercope, VP Sales at Experience Fayetteville. <laughs> Tim Chambers, VP of Marketing and Communications at Tulsa Regional Tourism. <laughs> Maria Gonzalez, Content and Community Engagement Manager at Travel Santa Ana. <laughs> Lara Brockway, Social Media Specialist at Visit Albuquerque. <laughs> Dakota Snyder, Senior Manager of Marketing and Special Events at Mammoth Lakes Tourism. And Helena uh, Ajakaya from Meet Boston unfortunately could not join us, uh, but she will be here tomorrow. So if you see her around, be sure to congratulate her. She's doing incredible work, uh, not only throughout Boston, but the greater Boston area. Uh, providing incredible leadership and mentorship uh, and really ensuring that both hospitality and tourism workers uh, have equitable opportunities uh, throughout the entire industry. So please make sure uh, to congratulate you, congratulate her if you see her tomorrow. Um, so the next 30-ish minutes, 38 per the timer, uh, we're going to go through each of the winners this year, uh, have them share a little bit about their background, um, but more than anything, because they are emerging tourism stars, we want to hear their perspective on uh, what really makes their destination organizations different, uh, what really drives them uh, to continue not only lifting up their organizations, but the communities that they work within. Uh, when we started this program with eTourism and Connect Travel about three years ago, the idea was to lift up and celebrate those in the tourism industry that are going above and beyond. Uh, we didn't want to put an age limit on it. There's enough 20 under 20s and 30 under 30s. We were seeing tourism leaders come into the industry at all different levels, and we wanted to make sure to celebrate them and those that are stepping up in, in big ways. So again, round of applause for this group, and then we're going to dive into the discussion. First up, Tina from Experience Fayetteville. I told you we're, we're going to get through this. You're going to be first up. It's going to be fine. Um, so... Being in charge of sales, I think you probably know as well as anybody that sales and marketing traditionally have a bad rap, often justified for not necessarily being super integrated uh, between their two teams. How are you and the marketing team at Experience Fayetteville finding ways to integrate uh, that maybe you, you weren't expecting? Sure. I think... Um so I'm new to the tourism uh, sector, so I've been in it for two years now, and the first year was like a whirlwind because we had an event that all hands on deck. So um, since then, I so from my background, I was always engaged with marketing, and coming into the DMO space, it was really interesting to me to find out that that's not technically the case um, and hadn't been in our office. So we recently have had some changes in our marketing and sales team and we just have identified that they go hand in hand. You know, whatever marketing is doing um, out on the interwebs, I'll just say that because I'm old. Um, so out into the interwebs, um, you know, I'm that face-to-face -face marketing person with every person that we meet. And so it's really hard for me to just sell Fayetteville if I don't know what marketing is doing on, on that side. And so we have come together to have a weekly meeting. Um, we talk about their campaigns, where they're targeting things, and then it just helps me with my sales approach to know, you know, who am I going to go after? What am I going to tell them about? Um, and without those things, I don't think I would be as successful. So it's really just about getting together and collaborating on a weekly basis to figure out what's next. Awesome. I think... <laughs> equally uh, unheard of is sales teams from competing destinations, somewhat competing destinations, working together uh, to lift up an entire region. And I know you and, and really all of Northwest Arkansas have, have really been focused on working together. Can you share kind of where that was born out of and, and some of the success that you've seen? 
Yes. <laughs> um, I would say that, um, I know it's so cliche to say, but a rising tide lifts all boats, buoys, dinghies, whatever it is that you're riding on. You know that old saying. Uh -huh. I was gonna use that. Oh, you were? Okay, well, Tim's <laughs> going to use that also. So, um, But I really, truly believe that. And so I've always been a person that wants to um, collaborate and work with others because I always learn from someone. And so it was really cyclocross, an event that I'll probably talk about later on, but it's a huge international event that gave our region the opportunity to really play well together. Um, we couldn't do it as one city, so we know that if we have a large um, international contingency that's coming in or groups of such, like Fayetteville doesn't have enough hotel rooms, you know, we don't have enough restaurants to house all those people. So really we, it kind of started there and then we've just taken it on and we have initiated a um, quarterly meeting where we all get together, we talk about challenges, we talk about things that are happening in the area um, and what can we do to, you know, elevate those events that are going to spread that economic impact through the entire, all the cities in Northwest Arkansas region. So that would be my answer there. I love it. Um, I think a lot of you can probably relate to this. Sporting events and bringing new events and, and festivals into your destinations. I know we, with our clients, have seen a lot of growth in that area. You all are no exception to that and have really brought in some pretty unique events. And I know you just hinted at one, but can you share some of the events that you've brought in and, and the impact that you've seen them have on the region? Yeah, so cyclocross is going to be the one that I'll say is most notable. Um, that happened in 2022. It was the Walmart UCI um, Cyclocross World Championships. We were only the second city in the United States to host that, um, that championship in the 74 years of its operating, I guess. Um, we were able to... Um, you know, host 200 unique athletes, which doesn't sound like a lot, but it brought 18,000 people into our region. And um, that alone was just something that kind of has propelled us to be able to build off of that and to acknowledge that, A, we can do it. And then that, you know, we're now notably recognized, Northwest Arkansas is, for that specific cycling style. So, um, and it's a fanatic style of cycling. I don't know how many cyclists are in here. I do not cycle with pedals. So um, it is a, a huge event to be able to pull off. And we were just really, you know, pleased that in the entire region came together to really welcome the world. If you know anything about Arkansas, there are some legislation pieces that are really prohibitive sometimes to, to us specifically in sports, um, and it hinders tourism. And I know that's kind of a touchy subject for a lot of people, but um, we were able to say, you know, the world is welcomed here. And that was really, really important for us. Nice. Um, if any of you have attended e-tourism for the last few years, I feel like there's typically a session on the future of the visitor center. Um, a lot of people have a lot of opinions on uh, what are happening with visitor centers moving forward. Share a little bit about what you all are doing that I'm guessing played a part in some of these sporting events as well and, and being able to take it out there. But it was a, a pretty unique angle that I, I think a lot of people would appreciate um, how you guys have approached it. Yeah, so I can't take credit for this. Our uh, previous VP of Marketing and Communications um, had seen a mobile visitor center being used somewhere. So curiosity um, sparked the interest to say, well, what does that mean? How do we how do we utilize that? And um, in right before cyclocross, we ended up with a Mercedes Sprinter van and um, nickname notably Vanny. Um, and Vanny travels around to a lot of events that um, you know our brick and mortar visitor center can't reach everyone. Um, they have to come to you. So we now go to them and we use it as an opportunity to um, engage people because it is a large, very well-wrapped, creatively done van um, that we use for jam in the van. We use it for selling merch that we would sell in our VC, passing out um, brochures, dine around guides, stickers. So it's just really an engagement piece. And I look forward to what we can do with it more because we've used it, but not to its full capacity yet. Nice. Um, last question for you. Um, for I didn't say this at the very beginning, but we had over 150 nominations this year. I think 
eight, maybe 10 nominations were for Tina alone, uh, which is the most number of nominations we've ever seen for anyone. Um, so congrats on that. And if there was one thing that came up more than collaboration in those nominations, it was your love of motorcycles um, and riding uh, with wheels, not pedals. Um, share a little bit about how that passion for motorcycles has really come into your everyday work. I mean, I think this is a, a good lesson for all the organizations to understand the, the passion points of, of their teams, understand the different perspectives and the different viewpoints they can bring, because I, I never would have thought, you know, a love of motorcycles could bring a, a unique perspective to a, a tourism marketing campaign, but I think you have a really unique story to share. Sure. <laughs> and it's always awkward because I feel like there's like this connotation around motorcycles and bikers and I really don't fit the image. But I have a immense passion for motorcycles and motorcycle tourism because it's such a way to explore the entire U.S., right? So um, two wheels, if you haven't done it, this is a plug. Get on two wheels. Try it. Just battle. Just do it. It's, it's amazing. Um, so for a long time... 20 plus years, a long time. Um, Fayetteville had been known as maybe the number two, three, um, you know, motor, home of the motorcycle, like largest motorcycle rally forever. Bikes, Blues, and Barbecue. And depending on who you talk to, it was, you know, the biggest. Um, and we lost that to a, to a city just north of us. And with, when we, I say lose it loosely, right? Because regionally we play together and it's still um, curating some, it's still doing things for us in Fayetteville. But, um, we had to decide, okay, all of our marketing is just designed to talk about a rally. How do we say, okay, the community doesn't really want a rally anymore, you know, there are, there are goods and bads on both sides of those, but our partners, our hoteliers, all, our restaurants, they're all still welcoming of that. So we don't want to just take that market and just leave it alone and never touch it again. So how do we change the narrative around that? So I've worked really hard with our marketing team to say, okay, you know, the standard Harley Davidson rider who's just looking for the twisty, turny roads and the paved routes. We already know that they're coming. We already know that they're here. What about the gravel road sensation that's hitting the nation? So if you don't know that, it is. It's hitting the nation in gravel cycling. It's hitting the nation, you know, driving tourism in, in enduro or adventure bike riding. Um, and so I just really was like, listen to me, please. Do not, um, do not just let this go. Let's invest some time and energy. And I've worked on four different routes that leave out of Fayetteville and go you know, all the way to a 150 mile route and loop back to Fayetteville so that we can still provide an experience that's a hub and spoke out of Fayetteville, but a different style of riding. And then jointly, I have worked with the state tourism to work on the back section of our motorcycling guide, which is about this big for gravel roads. And we have about this much gravel roads. So um, really did that. And I could go on and on for hours on this, so I will not Told you do she was that passionate about it. Because I'm so passionate about it. But I am super, um, you know, I'm just happy that I'm allowed to have this much passion and be this subject matter expert, basically for motorcycling within my organization, so. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Uh, Tim, you're in the hot seat now. Okay. And she already took your quote, so I don't. I know. I don't, you wanna like, just walk off. I liked having her just talk, I was cool with that. <laughs> um, so one of the things I love about this program is um, it really celebrates those that, that are coming into the tourism industry in a lot of different ways, and you didn't, come from the tourism industry. You, you came into it from a different background um, that I think probably influences a lot of the work that you're doing on a, on a daily basis. Can you share a little bit about your path uh, into tourism, some of the lessons that you brought with you and the, the perspective that you were able to bring with you and how you apply that every single day? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, I used to be an astronaut. No, I'm kidding. Um, I... Uh, Previously, before this, I started my career in an ad agency and then did like brand marketing, um, then moved into event marketing for a large B2B uh, events and media company. Uh, did that for over a decade and hopped over to another company doing that. Um, 
and then while COVID hit, I was like, man, I really want to start doing something like um, that my kids could actually see and, and, and take advantage of, of like being proud of me. So I was like, ah, oh, there's got to be something. Uh, someone tapped me on the shoulder and was like, hey, this opportunity is uh, available with Tulsa Regional Tourism. And I was like, okay, you know what? That's cool. That's appealing. Um, I was really drawn to the, the mindset of, and I, I mean, everything I'm telling you is preaching to the choir. Um, I really like the fact that no one is going to universally enjoy the product you're selling. It's not like drinking Pepsi. Like we don't, we just use it for drinking, right? Um, but everyone experiences Tulsa different. So that means I have millions of opportunities to sell the, um, the, the region uh, differently. Uh, coming on, it was nice because obviously you're the new person. You don't know what you don't know. But that allows you to also ask questions and then maybe see some like bridges that haven't been built yet, um, opportunities for sharing um, assets. Um, it's really expensive to obviously shoot video all the time. It's really expensive to get professional photography, but really tapping on the shoulders of other individuals in the community and even at the state level and saying, why are we not sharing these freely and readily uh, with each other? So kind of opened up a network that um, we do that within the region. Uh, anything I shoot, no questions asked, it, it also is given to that um, attraction or that hotel. It just doesn't matter to me. I, I want them to be able to market themselves more powerfully. And if I'm not doing it, they can continue to do it. Uh, and then same with the state level. They were very receptive of it. They're like, yeah, sure, you got it. So, um, And then just within our own walls of our organization, just allowing me to... Um, just notice, like, uh, one of the sessions earlier talked about how important it was that sales and marketing and services maybe kind of understand what each other does. Um, I was able to be so dumb and say, I want to know what you're doing. So I sat down during calls, and it really showed to those different groups, like, oh, wow, they're taking an interest in what we're doing. Um, my organization's pretty complex. It's got a lot of different brands stacked up on top of it. So you have that... Um, what, what about me? I'm being forgotten mentality. So doing that just out of necessity really kind of helped repair some um, internal rubs and relationships. So, yeah. I think you successfully answered every single one of my questions in one answer. Yeah, there you go. You win another award for that, so there well you done. Um, I do have one wild uh, curveball for you, which is um, based on your history in advertising, and now kind of being on the client side, uh, what is one thing you wish you, you knew when you were on the agency side uh, now that you're on the client side? Just how much local potential there is for business. In an agency, you're always chasing these giant great white buffaloes and these, these ghosts. Like, you know, we want to work with this national firm, but there's so much work to be done in the local market. Um, Obviously, I wasn't always the one making those decisions. Sometimes there are existing accounts, but um, yeah, there's like limitless work within 10 miles of you. It's, it's kind of ridiculous. Perfect. Thank you very much. Lara, you've been waiting patiently down there uh, from Visit Albuquerque. Um, we're going to talk quite a bit about social uh, with you, and I'm going to try to ask you some individual questions unless you want to take the Tim approach to, to answering them all. Um, what do you think the key benefits of using social media for desti destination marketing are? You know, there's, it, there's plenty of conversations around social and how measurable it is and is it actually driving impact, and um, what do you see as some of the key benefits? Yeah, yeah. So um, I think that it's a great way to really meet people where they are um, and to be really quick because a lot of other forms of media take a lot of time and planning and a lot more money. Whereas if there's a new restaurant in town in a neighborhood that you kind of want to elevate, you can just pop there, film that, post it the same day, and right away it gets results. So that's what I think is kind of the biggest thing about um, being on social media sites. How do you balance the need to create? engaging, relatable content with staying true to the Visit Albuquerque brand. Uh, do you find yourself walking a tightrope? Um, so I don't, uh, but our, for example, our TikTok isn't necessarily 
entertainment-based, it's more education-based. So we're not hopping on trending sounds or cap cut templates, not that often, I've done it like three times. Most of the time it's just educating on four things to do this spring, four hikes to do this summer. Um, here's a new restaurant in downtown or a rooftop bar and that seems to be really great because then we can stick with our brand guidelines um, and our brand pillars which are ballooning and cuisine and culture and heritage and we can stick with that very easily because it's just educating about the things that we believe people make people interested in Albuquerque and we have great ballooning and we have great cuisine and so it's really easy to talk about. How are you measuring that and are you are you measuring it at the partner level or are you just measuring it at the brand level? Is there, is there anything you're doing down to the partner level to, to prove success? Yeah, so to measure our success, we do our typical KPIs that I think a lot of people in social media do, which is um, obviously engagement and followers and everything like that. But we do take a lot of anecdotal evidence to heart as well. Um, so we hear from people around the community, oh, you're doing really great for Albuquerque. You're showing Albuquerque's positive sides, which is really great and really needed. Um, and on top of that, yeah, definitely working with partners and their stories after we post are great. So for example, we recently posted about a train that was giving free tours and I am not a train person, um, but we went and we took a video of it and we posted it and it got so many more views than I was ever expecting. So I guess there's a lot of train people in the world. Um, and it ended up, they reported in the next week that um, they had a great rise in people coming to these free tours and also the demographic change. So it was previously older men that would come because they were interested in trains, they were former engineers, things like that. It changed to families and younger people and women and it was really cool to see that trains are for everybody um, and not just trains, that's just an example, but there's also <laughs> bars and stuff like that. That um, Everyone get a train. Yeah, exactly. A little work, <laughs> little tip. But within the week after posting, if it does do very well on TikTok or Instagram, um, the partners can see those um, benefits pretty much right away. So. You sparked something, and if you don't feel comfortable answering this, I, I, you don't have to answer it. But I think you brought up a valid point of, especially somebody in your role, not only promoting the destination, but also having to do some reputation management or, or crisis management. And, and you mentioned having to show the good side of Albuquerque and promote that. But how do you mediate some of those conversations that may find their way into the destination's social media? Yeah, so um, we try to, if there's a question, a genuine question, we'll really try to answer that, not necessarily delete it if it might be leading. Um, but additionally, we have um, locals that will come to the defense right away. And that's honestly the best thing, because if you just have one voice kind of speaking and fighting all these opinions, that's not great. But if you have locals and kind of let that conversation go on its own, it tends to um, kind of change opinions a little bit more effectively, so. Thank you. Um, Last question, what are some of the key trends in social media everybody in this room should know about uh, that maybe are a little less known at the moment? Well, I think, um, you know, besides kind of the obvious ones, ones which is like, for example, TikTok potentially might be banned or something like that, I think what is really interesting is that a lot of people are talking about the effects of social media on mental health. Um, and I feel like I've seen a lot more genuine conversation from a lot of younger people on social media sites about it, and so I think it'll be interesting to see how that awareness is going to affect how people use social media, and maybe they'll limit it a little bit more, or maybe they'll use it for different reasons, and so that's what I think is kind of, not really a trend, but just like a general change in conversation. That's interesting to me, and I'm curious how it'll be in the future, so. Thank you. Maria, it's your time. Um, we previously discussed, and, and full disclosure, I heard about Maria probably about a year ago uh, when one of my colleagues got the chance to meet her, and, and he came back. He was working on a branding project uh, for Travel Santa Ana, and he was like, you have to meet Maria. And I'm like, I can't wait to meet Maria. And then I'm on stage with Maria now, so I'm very excited about it. But in our previous discussions, uh, we kind of talked about your journey to travel Santa Ana. It included job at a museum, a, an audition at Disney to be a dancer, I believe, that maybe ended up in guest services, Dave and Buster's, uh, downtown Santa Ana. Uh, share a little bit about some of those takeaways from your journey 
uh, from all those places and how you're applying them uh, to your role at Travel St. Anna now. Great. And I get super tongue-tied, so forgive me. Like, I prepare notes. <laughs> but um, one of the things that all my jobs taught me, um, first of all, one of my strengths, and sometimes for years I thought it was my weakness, I'm multi-passionate. <laughs> So, you know, like, I love to do everything, right? I'm like, ooh, I want to be a dancer. Yeah, I could be a dancer. I want to be, not an astronaut, no. I want to be a doctor. I'm like, no, I want to be, you know, a politician. No. But, um, so I got all these really fun jobs. Um, and one of the things that it taught me was being flexible. You have to be open to new experiences, and you have to be willing to try new things, because it's when you try those new things that an unexpected opportunity comes along, kind of like this job. <laughs> um, also, um, all these jobs taught me customer service. Um, I know everybody here is customer service, but basically prioritizing you know, the needs of your visitors and your guests and ensuring that their satisfaction um, is the first thing that's really important to you. You can thank Disney for that, just kidding. <laughs> um, also, relationships. It taught me that relationships are super crucial. Um, that in my new role is key in promoting the destination. And also my other nickname, like being a super connector. Like if you're really out there knowing your community, partnerships, collaborations are going to come super easy. And then my favorite is creativity. You really have to think outside the box and you have to find innovative solutions that can help, in this case, a destination marketing organization stand out in a very crowded marketplace because I want to visit all your destinations. You know, what's unique about Santa Ana? Awesome. Um, you know, a lot of you all work with influencers every single day. A lot of DMOs uh, are partnering with them, contracting with them. Rarely do they hire one. Um, and you just mentioned your other nickname, the Super Connector, but your other other nickname is the Hot Tortilla, uh, local Santa Ana influencer. Yes, or La Tortilla Ta Caliente. <laughs> Talk to me about how you are parlaying that role as a, a local celebrity, a, a local influencer, into the, the job you got at Travel Santa Ana, because you may share a little bit about this. The, the position didn't really exist, and they found a position for you. Um, and so I, th I think it's a great story, and I'd love to hear just a little bit more about it. Like, I'm like, the job description, literally, like my boss, and many of you probably know her, um, Wendy, Wendy Hossie. <laughs> she created this job for me, like job description and everything. She's like, where do you fit in? But I think, um, well... On social media, I go by the hot tortilla, and this was before social media was cool, right? I wanted to be a blogger, another one of my passions, right? And I was a food blogger at first, extra pounds, just, just kidding. And um, basically, one of my passions was finding hidden gems. Hidden gems, um, before I would travel a lot, it's just hidden gems in Santa Ana, hidden gems in my local community. I mean, everyone knows about, for example, those cool attractions in your city, like the museum or, um, I don't know, but they don't know where you can really get like the best tacos, right? So I'm like, this is the best taco stand or this is where you can get really good coffee. It looks a little cringe, you know, to walk in, but trust me, you have to go here. Um, so I think the fact that I was already out there in the community interviewing the business owners or working with like basically like all the partners and other influencers to find these hidden gems kind of prepared me for this role. Yeah, you, you touched on this just a little bit, but I, I think early on you were able to establish your own voice and your own perspective as a, from, as a personal brand of yours. What advice do you have for the, the organizations in here on how to create, and I cringe to say the word authentic, but a, a more true to destination voice or a, a stronger perspective uh, in all the content that they're putting out? Yes. Um, I know I know that word now. Everybody's like, authentic, authentic. No, but you really have to like 
live up to that experience. So, um, for example, what we're doing in Santa Ana is, I mean, we have a beautiful downtown, but it's a city that's over 154 years old and it's never had a destination marketing organization. So how do we tell a very authentic story is, well, first of all, shout out to, and they didn't pay me for this, MMGY Global who did Don't our ring the branding. <laughs> they did our branding and they basically sat down with over 300 like residents and they interviewed everyone like what is the true um, brand attributes, you know, and, and branding is more than, you know, the branding, the cool colors and everything. Um, and I mean, some people, for example, some people in the community, they're very, very white. I mean, you know, and they're like, um, you guys, your marketing is too Hispanic. It's too colorful. I'm like, but you guys come and eat all our delicious food and you come to all the <laughs> festivals. Um, so how do we really keep it authentic is actually by not making up something that it's not. Like people for years, we're the, it's in Orange County and it's basically where all the county buildings are. So whenever you hear something negative in the news, Oh, it's in Santa Ana. In Santa Ana. Well, that's where the federal courts are. So, of course, it's in Santa Ana. But um, people are always like, how are you really going to be authentic? And it's, for example, um, we have OC Pride. We have a Pride Festival. And we're not going to promote our destination as, like, the safest area to come and, you know, openly express yourself. Because if you walk down the street... Um, cultures, it's, it's very, um, it's 80% Hispanic, but also uh, like Vietnamese. And in a lot of the cultures, if they see you holding hands with somebody of the same sex, they're going to look at you kind of funny, you know? So we're not going to promote something that we're not. So I hope that answered. It did. Last question for you. Um, I don't know how many in the room have been a part of a starting a destination marketing organization. Uh, you mentioned Travel Santa Ana didn't exist a couple years ago. Um, what advice coming into a brand new organization would you give some of the older organizations in the room that maybe uh, need a fresh perspective or want a fresh perspective? You know, is there anything that you've learned from a, from a startup perspective, basically, uh, with the destination organization that you want to share? Full disclaimer, I got hired in June, so it's all, and I haven't even been here one year, and one of the things that I love about being part of the process of creating a brand new um, organization for basically our city is the fact that we get to make it up as we go. So we get to take a lot of risks, and I think that's something that everyone else can learn. Um, a lot of older DMOs usually fall, um, like they, they already have their patterns and they already know what to follow and they're afraid to kind of break the mold a little bit. So definitely take risks. Um, one of the really cool things, we're a small and mighty team of three, I like to say. We don't have a office um, and it's, I mean, it's kind of smart because that helps us get creative and we're like, okay, where are we going to meet? Because we still meet as a team. Well, we decided let's meet at all of our different hotels in our destination and that's super helpful. Like we get to see how the front desk staff interacts with the visitors that are coming to destination, our destination. Where are they sending them to have a meal, you know? Um, so that's super awesome and it also helps us just Stay fresh and, you know, stay creative. I love it. Thank you. Last up, Dakota. Howdy. It's your turn. <laughs> um, you know, I think a lot of times in advertising and destination marketing, when things get stressful, get chaotic, it's pretty common for us to all look at each other and go, you know what, we're not saving lives. Um, and... Dakota is the exception to that because Dakota actually is saving lives in addition to working at Mammoth Lakes Tourism. You're a firefighter, 
Um, literally saving lives right now as Mammoth Lakes is under massive amounts of snowfall. You spent time in the Forest Service doing solo trips into the backcountry for days, weeks at a time. Um, you eventually led over 25 education programs at Yosemite National Park, kind of on the front lines. You truly have seen firsthand um, the impact of tourism on these destinations and on you know, these very, very uh, fragile ecosystems. How do you now balance promoting tourism within an organization while also clearly wanting to protect it and sustain it? It's a big question. It is such a huge a question. question. Um, yeah, so I was working the front lines of environmental education in Yosemite National Park when the Park Service launched their Find Your Park campaign. And we saw explosive growth within our natural spaces all the way through up until when COVID was happening. We saw explosive growth out in our natural spaces as well. It was a safe place where people could still go recreate. Living in Mammoth Lakes, California, ski resorts didn't shut down during COVID. We were an outdoor mecca for people to be able to go and explore and to go play. And when I was working in Yosemite National Park, we, you know, one of the missions and main goals of the Park Service is to preserve and protect, right? They have this entire idea of they're going to preserve nature for the enjoyment of future generations. There's two things that don't go hand in hand, right? Is preservation on a land for people to be able to enjoy it, right? And so it's trying to figure out how to address both of those buckets at the same time moving forward. And, you know, one of the ways that you have to be able to figure that out is through this entire idea of if you can engage people to have a deeper care about those places that they're going to see and they're going to visit, even if it's just a small kid that has a takeaway that they bring back to their parents, or if you can engage an entire group of people to have a different mentality, if they can take that home with them from your destination, you can start changing the way that they view some of our natural spaces and the ways that they're interacting. And that's manifested its way into my position with Mammoth Lakes Tourism now, where you know we have a really unique stance on our interactions with our visitors. And all of us collectively as an organization, half of our team was pretty much from Yosemite National Park as well, but we have this really unique outlook on we have to, this is what we market. We're marketing nature. And if our destination is getting destroyed and this nature and this resource isn't there, our local stakeholders, the locals who live in our small community, they're not going to want to see the tourists there. This is our livelihood in a tourist economy. And then on top of that, the guests are going to have a bad experience. And overall, we're going to be hurting our planet. And come on now, we don't want to do that. Nobody wants to do that. Nobody. Um, I think oftentimes, though, trying to protect the environment and promote environmental stewardship can feel so massive and so overwhelming. And I think it scares a lot of destinations from doing anything. They, they just... They're like, I don't want to touch it. I'm, I'm scared of it. How are you guys measuring success of, of the work that you're doing? Totally. So that's one of the hardest questions, right? Is like, okay, how do we actually measure a reduce on impact into our environments around us? And let me tell you, one, it's hard to come up with something tangible in a tangible way. You can go walk out on a trailhead and see, okay, we have less literal trash out amongst our community or, oh, more people are utilizing reusable water bottles and this and that. But I think the bigger takeaway from it is starting to see other people who are coming into our region actively pushing for these certain type of policies, right? We host a giant Eastern Sierra trash cleanup. We cleaned up over 26,000 tons of garbage from our tourism DMO itself, activating 280 miles of different cleanups throughout our region. And over half the people that showed up for it to help do this were tourists and visitors and guests to our region. It wasn't even just the local community that was doing that. And so to see the reach that you have as a DMO where it's not just, hey, come to our region to come and enjoy it, you're activating these people who actually care about your destination, who, you know, we had tourists from Switzerland that were bringing their kids because they heard it was going on. And how fun would it be to teach our kids that this is something you should be doing, is that whole idea of recreating responsibly and really keeping our destination, our campaign that we have right now is called the real unreal, right? We're keeping our destination unreal because it truly is so unreal there. Awesome. I 
I think that's a good note to end on. I appreciate it, Dakota. I appreciate everybody uh, for doing what they do every single day with their organizations, with their communities. Um, I would like one last round of applause. We do have awards for everybody um, and a little photo op. Thank you all for sticking around uh, and looking forward to seeing you all tomorrow.